At the absolute minimum, what are the results you guys should get for us? If two really good ideas that he wanted to implement in his business. Referrals might be based on your ROI and based on the unit of sale and based on the conversion rate. Rob was wired for action, for activity. And do you have and who do you need? Maui Mastermind presents the Business Coach Podcast, answering your questions and providing real actionable insights for building a better, stronger, more profitable business without sacrificing your time, life, or freedom anymore. Well, welcome to episode number six for The Business Coach. I hope you're having a great day. On this episode, we're gonna be doing part two of a two-part series on marketing. Specifically, how do you take control of your marketing so that you're actually getting consistent results? And, and what we said was that this episode is gonna be for you if the following things are true, right? This is gonna be for you if you've ever been frustrated with too few leads or you have inconsistency with those leads or you've been frustrated that you feel like you just don't know what's working or what isn't working in your marketing. Like it's this mystery black box and you're not sure how to make it, to impact it, to make it work better. And especially for this episode, if you've ever worked with an outside marketing firm or you've had internal marketing people but you just didn't know how to manage them and to best leverage them so they actually do what they promised they would do, this episode is going to be really important for you. So in the last episode, what we talked through was, was marketing as a challenge for a middle stage owner reliant to company, right? This middle stage level two company. And this episode, we're gonna be focusing in more on the advanced stage level two, which is a rapidly scaling company that still has owner reliances, but is starting to have leaders and key pillars of the company, whether that be sales, marketing, operations, finance, etc. So that one or more of those pillars, usually two or more of those pillars are owned by someone other than the owner. And so now you're starting to have the business take on a life bigger and broader than just the owner, him or herself. And so in this episode, as we focus on the marketing, that's the frame. And it, and, and it comes back to an email that I got from a client that I just, he's a really just dear man. I really enjoy him. His name is Bob. And Bob is, he's a, a tall, big man. He came from a background of 30 plus years in public accounting. A really smart guy. Um, just very nice. I, I always like to watch how people treat other people when they don't think people are watching. And he's always very kind and, and very takes interest in people at his tables when we're at the various uh, business workshops we do for our business coaching clients. He really is that way, which I so enjoy about him. He probably doesn't even know that I enjoy that about him, but it's true. Um, but he had brought up a situation and I just felt like it seemed like fun. I wanted to jump in and help with him. And the situation was, he said, David, off this last event he was at, um, he got two really good ideas that he wanted to implement in his business, one of which was to bring in an outside fractional um, chief marketing officer, a CMO. And he went through his miniature plan for how he's going to do that. And I had some thoughts that I shared back with him with an audio message, which I'll do from time to time from, for various coaching clients that we have. You know, Bob works with a different one of our Maui coaches, but, you know, I, I like taking interest in it from time. It's fun. And I thought what he's dealing with is so common for other advanced stage level two business owners, and quite frankly, even for some of the more advanced middle stage level two business owners, wherein they want to get more and do their marketing better. So they think, I need to bring in a better talented person to run my marketing. But if they're not careful, they don't know how to choose who they need. They don't know how to bring them on in such a way that they can manage them so that they get the best of that person. And generally, marketing hires are really expensive, whether it's internal hired person or an external vendor third party that you're hiring. They're expensive. When you find the right one, they are worth their weight in gold. But, and this is also true, when you don't find the right one or you don't manage them well to get their best, what happens is you can waste hundreds of thousands of dollars only to wake up four months, six months, 12 months later and think, you know, I wasted that money. And it's a big deal. That's money that could go right to your bottom line, money that could have been used more intelligently to, to get you better results. Now, Bob is in a rapidly scrolling company. When we started working with him, he was here. Here he is roughly three, three and a half years later. He is 10 times larger. Well done, Bob. You did fantastic. And he's got some pillar leaders. In fact, the two main pillar leaders in his company, other than himself, are his two daughters, which I think is really cool. Um, you know, his plan one day is to grow this business, continue to scale it, take it to level three, and his succession plan is to have this business be taken over by his daughters, which I think is really cool. 
My kids are too young right now to take over Maui, but maybe someday they'll be interested. If not, um, I don't know what we'll do at that point. I don't, the idea of selling the company is just, just abhorrent to me. I, I love the business so much. I like what I get to do. You know, I take plenty of time off, five plus months a year, so it's not like I'm overworking. But I would miss you. I would miss the opportunity to share and, and, and create ideas and to see the impact on people's lives and the engagement of the business. I, I tried retirement ones. That, that didn't work. I, after I sold my first um, successful exit, I thought, oh, I'll retire. And that lasted for less than 30 days. And I'm like, no, I like business too much. But coming back to Bob, he runs a, 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 a contracting business. Right? So we'll call it that. So think of it as a blue collar service business. Now what I'm gonna share with you about what he says applies to professional service firms, it applies to manufacturers, it applies to other types of service businesses that are more what we'll call white collar service businesses, it applies to all of them. There's no business this doesn't apply to. So the first question that you have when you wanna bring somebody in, and I think this is really important, which is who do you actually need in terms of to, to run your marketing or to be part of your marketing hires? There are two main categories of marketing hire. We'll have, I'm gonna call them, and this is self-created over the years just because painfully I've learned this the hard way. You have what I'll call the strategist. These people are incredibly well-spoken. These people are, are articulate. These people are, like, they seem so smart. And they are, they are. Um, the problem with a strategist though is they tend to be more about theory. Them getting their hands dirty actually writing a marketing piece. Them getting their hands dirty in your, in your database to actually set up the, the tracking on a website. Them actually putting together the elements of a funnel, they're really not interested in doing. Right? So the second type of person that you have in that role is I'll call them a doer. A marketing doer. This is the person who they might have some ideas about strategy. But generally speaking, they're at their best doing it, getting their hands in the engine of your marketing, you know, writing the drip email campaign or setting up the, the working with the graphics company for the trade show um, booth that you're putting together, um, working on a direct mail piece with a third party company, et cetera. So here's, here's kind of what I would say. What I share with Bob is he had grown and scaled, but if he doesn't have internal doers, hiring a marketing strategist, and by the way, he termed it, a, a, a fractional CMO, chief marketing officer, a fractional CMO is going to be the very most expensive person you could hire from a marketing standpoint, simply because of the title. And at where his company is at less than $5 million a year, he doesn't need a, a, a chief marketing officer. He needs possibly a marketing director, um, possibly that he might need. Maybe it's a marketing manager. I'm not totally sure. Um, but the marketing CMO is probably not who he needs. Now, a strategist... This is great for if you have if you have what I'll call a level two advanced business or even a level three business, wherein you have enough scale and you already have internal doers, and you have already have external doers. Now, an internal doer is Jill, who runs um, your social media for you internally. She's an employee of your company or directly works with you guys. An external vendor would be. Um, Joe, who you contract out for, and he creates funnels when you want him to. So if you've already got the doers, internal and or external, and you're looking for someone to put all the pieces together in a unified way so that you know where to focus your limited resources better, and then to manage all these people doing that, then a strategist could very well be who you need. But if you're expecting that strategist to roll up his or her sleeves, my experience is it's like trying to herd a cat to go take a bath. They just don't want to do it. They like the ideas, the theory versus the doing. Now the right person with that is also very good about getting great work from your internal and your external doers. They'll hold them accountable in a great way. They'll be able to coordinate what's going on. So there are times and places where you need that higher order marketing person. But just ask yourself first, if you're thinking about bringing on marketing talent, do you already have the internal or external or combination doers, the people that will actually do the implementation? If you don't have that, you shouldn't make your first hire a strategist. Your first hire really should be on the doer side of things. 
Now, the doers that you might hire might be someone on the funnel sides for setting up your marketing funnels and your conversion rate optimization. Maybe for you it's a generalist that you're looking for because a lot of your marketing is not online but it's offline. They're going to help you know, start taking charge of some of the direct mail companies that you work with and they're going to make sure that your basic drip email sequences are going to be good. Right? So what I'm sharing with you is the doer part. This is the person who wants to actually cook in the kitchen. They don't just want to come up with the recipes. They don't just want to plan the menu, which a strategist does. They want to actually get in there and actually get their hands dirty cooking in doing the marketing work. Now, you could say, David, do I have to make is it a choice of either or? No, there are some rare limited people who can do both fairly well. But you have to ask yourself, and this is incredibly important, do you need more of a strategist right now or do you need more of a doer right now? The strategist is about finding the best pathway forward, how to coordinate various things, how to manage and hold people accountable. The doer tends to get lost in the activity of doing the marketing. What is it you need? If you don't have a very mature marketing uh, capability yet, err on the side of getting more of the marketing doer or doers. That's a better way to go. If you do have a fairly robust marketing um, pillar to your company and you just think you need a higher order person to run the whole, that's where the strategist comes into play. And that's a time and a place where that strategist can really do some, some good for you. All right. So as we come back, so the first question is, who do you need? You know, if I just go hire that marketing person, I'm not clear on who I need. Because I'll tell you, the marketing strategist, they can put uh, a picture about how they can do the marketing. I, I don't care what people tell me in the interview. I say, show me what you've done. Walk me through. Show me some of the funnels you've created. Give me some of the copy that you wrote. If you're working for someone pay-per-click, walk me through some of the, the pay-per-click campaigns that you've run in the last 12 months. Right? I want to look at what they've actually done. Now, if I need more of the theorist, I'm probably more, more of the strategist because I'm wanting them to coordinate the whole. You know, I'm going to ask them to tell me about their direct experiences where they've come into a marketing um, department of a company that was fairly fractured and going in different directions and pulled it together. Think of a specific instance. What were the challenges you faced? Okay, when you came with this challenge, what did you do to overcome it? Okay, when that happened, what happened next? I'm going to get into not what, I don't want to ask them in the interview, tell me, do you know the way to do this? I don't want to ask hypotheticals. I want to ask them practical things about what they've faced and they've done. I don't care what they say or know. I care what they've done. That's how I interview to find a better person. But I have to know, do I need strategist or do I need a doer? And it's not either or, but it's one before the other. I need doers before I can have a strategist. A strategist without doers is a waste of money. It's an expensive waste of money. And that was my first set of coaching for Bob to make sure he thinks through who does he need based on what he currently has. The next place I want to go to is how do I intelligently, um, if, if I am bringing in an outside vendor, how do I intelligently make sure that I get their best? Um, you know, over 20 years of coaching, a lot of clients will say, oh, I hired a, I hear this story all the time. I hired an outside marketing firm. They promised me the world. They seemed really good with what they did. They had great referrals and references. <sighs> but when they came in, we were spending 7,000 a month, 10,000 a month, 25,000 a month. And what we got was not at all what was promised. They were slow on their deliverables. They were inconsistent with the results. Every time we called them to account about this, they gave us excuses. And then here we are a year later, and I just finally got fed up and just fired them. Now, notice a couple things with that. They promised us the world, but the delivery was different. Um, they were consistently behind on deliverables. We would complain, and they would start to do a little bit better, but then they, they just still fell behind. Um, and after a year, I just got fed up, and I let them go. Now, here's a cool uh, <laughs> an interesting thing. Um, the, the elements in common with that, you think about it, are what do they promise me? Number two, what did they actually deliver? And you hear complaints like they were slow or late on the delivery of what they promised. And then the final one I'm bringing up here, number three, I finally got fed up and fired them oftentimes a year later. So as you hear me say that, do you see, I'm, I've slowed it down enough. Do you see the pattern that's there? First of all, 
I can almost guarantee you from coaching as many clients as I had, they did not nail the deliverables. The promises were never put down in writing. They were in a sales conversation. Because here's what a marketing firm often will do. They'll have their very best of them when they're doing the sales portion of the relationship. And then, after you bought, commonly, you get their second tier attention once they start doing the work. And over time, that second tier attention can even become their third tier attention because their best time and talent goes after finding more clients. I, I see this happen with marketing agency after marketing agency. It's, a, it's become a cliche. How do you keep this from happening? Number one, when you have promises that are being made, make sure that you document what those processes are in the sales process. So if I'm talking to Jill and I say, Jill, so I want to be clear here. If we were to work with your agency and you were to take over you know, our, our um, social media marketing, our SEO marketing, um, our, our redoing of our website, et cetera, tell me what, what results should we expect from you if you do your role well? I'm taking clear notes. I'm writing it down. Hey, you said this. Be more specific. What would we actually see? Get it, nail them to as specific as you can. And in the sales function, they will. Document that through. So got it. What I'm hearing from you is, make sure I got this right in my notes, we should expect from you X, Y, and Z. And I really go through a whole page or two of notes with that part. Am I, am I accurate with what our expectation should be? Got it. At the absolute minimum, what, what are the results you guys should get for us? If, if you did your work at, you know, to the standard that you consistently do, um, what's the minimum results we should expect from you? And I document that. Almost every third party company, what they're going to want to do is they're going to want to have some kind of contract with you. And usually if it's a third party company, they're going to have their own version of that contract. I make sure that I append and make as an attachment to that contract the promises that they made. You know, here's what the promises are. You know, here's the results we expect to see. Here's the absolute worst case results that we will see. Here's what they say they're going to do. And I put it in real detail because almost always their contract has all kinds of things that soften the promises that they're making. Now, one of two things is going to happen when you do that. Some of those companies that you do that with will want to go back and actually redefine what they're promising. Well, I'd rather find that up, up front. Wait, when you told me this, I took notes carefully. I asked you about it. Okay, so, and then I can see, am I willing to live with what their promises are? If they're not willing to have their promises put in, they're not a guarantee, although I'd love to have it be that way. I mean, why can't a services firm make a real guarantee? I mean, we do that with coaching clients. We, you know, we guarantee for a coaching client who, who makes a strong start with us, we say that within the first year of coaching, they'll have a 200% return on investment for every coaching dollar. So they'll have paid for their coaching and got another 100% on top of that from every coaching dollar within the first year. Now, of course, we have to put some caveats. You know, they have to, to do their part. You know, they're going to have to have their action plans and, and, and do the action steps that they committed to be on time for coaching sessions, et cetera. We put a reasonable floor with that, you know, 80%. If they've hit 80% of their deliverables, hit 80% of their coaching sessions on time, et cetera, we, we know that they have a very like, high likelihood of having a great result of getting that ROI. I don't know why more marketing firms won't do that, but real, realistically, they're not going to do that. Realistically, they're not. But by at least defining it here, here's the protection it gives you. Number one, You've, you've put them on notice that you're going to have high expectations from them and you're meticulous about how you're going to follow up with that. They can't later on say, well, we never promised that. Well, it's right here in the contract. We went through it in the sales process. I, I, I followed up with you to make sure I got it all accurate. We went back and forth in the contract. It is clearly spelled out. So it puts them on notice. What that means is when they go to deliver, they're going to start off delivering really well. Notice I said they're going to start off delivering well or have higher odds of starting off to deliver well. It also does one more thing. Most of those contracts are going to want six month, 12 month, 36 month commitments. And by the way, if they're good at what they do, you're not going to have a problem giving them a longer term commitment. But you need to make sure that if they don't deliver on what they promised, that you're not stuck in a contract that they're not delivering their share. So usually they'll have some kind of uh, commitment. And you can write in there saying, hey, you know, if, if the third party defaults on what they've promise to us, right, the vendor defaults on that, then we do have as an option to cancel the agreement with written notice. It's a way to protect you. And by doing that, you raise the stakes for them. 
and you get initially better delivery. Initially. David, why do you keep saying initially? Well, because that's what I mean. What will happen, though, is if you don't do that at all, you're going to get bad delivery probably from the very beginning. They're going to be low, slow undeliverables. You know, hey, you're paying them $10,000 a month, but they're two weeks behind on the deliverables. You just paid $20,000 for the deliverables because <laughs> it took two months to do what they should have done in a month. It happens all the time. Make sure that in your contract, you always want to, where possible, with a vendor like that, pay in arrears. Hey, you do the work, we'll pay you at the end of the month. Or you do two weeks of the work, we'll make the first uh, bi-weekly payment. Right? Pay in arrears. That also puts the onus on them to deliver. They don't deliver or they're late on their deliverables. Hey, should, how, do we, how do you want to work this through adjusting your payment? By this point in time, you said you're going to have these things done. You've done half of it. Would it be reasonable for us to pay you half? And when you get the other things done and catch up, then we'll pay the other half? They might not like it. But at least now you're, you're from the very beginning letting them know that you're going to be a fair but demanding client. You'll pay on time and you won't begrudge that, but you'll expect and hold them accountable to their delivery. Now we go into how do we manage this over time. So I can't just start the relationship there. I've got to manage this relationship really well. But now that I have clear deliverables and what the results should be, Part of my conversation up front was, how are we going to know that you're doing the work? What are we going to see? What are you going to measure? How are you going to report to us? That's all been part of the front end conversation. And so now I need to make sure that there's one person inside my company who owns and is responsible for managing that third party vendor relationship. And on a weekly basis should be in contact with that company. Now, there might be that they set up a project management website for you to look at. There might be that they're sending you a, a weekly report. But on a weekly basis, I want to know what's been going on. And the moment I see something that's not been addressed, I bring it up. Hey, at first I'm not harsh about it. Hey, I noticed that this week you were going to get done this. I didn't get that report. Was that done? It was supposed to get to me yesterday. Here I am following up right away with it. You're going to be a broken record so that they know that they can't get away with giving you the second or third tier delivery. If they want your contract, they want your business, they're going to have to give you their best game. Next in there, at least once a month, ideally once every two weeks, you're going to have a conversation with them and I would make it a standing meeting at least once a month, ideally once every two weeks. Now, this doesn't have to be the owner. It doesn't. It could be somebody else in their business. Remember we talked about the, the strategist versus the, the doer? If you do have enough of these resources, a strategist would be a great person to manage that relationship. They're very good if they're a good strategist to manage those third-party vendors. That's a strength of theirs. Again, it's not requiring that they get their hands dirty. It lets them pop in and do the part that they love. So I have to manage that relationship. And if it starts going left or right, I need to address it orally, telling them on a, on a meeting. I need to follow up in writing. Hey, you promised these things. These are where you're late. We're putting you on notice. This is not going to work for us. You hold them accountable. You do that consistently. You do that, the odds, not the, not the guarantee, but the odds that you'll get their A game are much greater. And truly, if you have a good selection of who you chose, and if you get their A game, you're probably going to get some good results. If you made a bad selection, that's a different matter. But if you make a good selection but don't manage the relationship well, your odds of getting their best game go diminish, diminish, diminish. You need to manage the relationship. And then the final comment I make here is if doing that, you're right on top of it and they're not delivering, you're going to find that out within two, three months. You're not going to take you 12 months to do that. It's not going to, you're going to be able to see based on their behaviors did we make the right or wrong call? And if you haven't made the right call, you're going to shift quickly to get another company in there instead. And I think that's an important part for you educating yourself. OK, I'm going to go one more thing here. I want to talk about how do we think about our marketing and tracking of our marketing. Like what? I want to, I want to give you the 10 minute version of a quick boot camp course about what and how you track and how you should think numerically about the, what the numbers in your marketing mean um, such that any business owner or any business person who marketing is a part of what you need to know about, but it's not your current best expertise, you're going to have a framework to do that well. If you are strong in the marketing, you'll, pine, you'll find one or two refinements from what I'm about to share with you that you'll go, man, that's good stuff. So let's do that here right now. I'm going to give you 10 numbers to be tracking on your baseline marketing tracking. 10 numbers here right now. And as we go through that here, what I want to do is we're going to kind of matrix this out. So first of all, we're going to think about what 
What is the tactic? TAC. I'm spelling that wrong. It's T A C T. <laughs> it's driving me crazy here. So, what's the tactic? The first column is going to be what's the tactic? Or you might call that what's the lead source? Either way would be appropriate. Okay? That's the first one that we're going to be doing here. The second column over from that is going to be um, you're going to be measuring the number of leads. Oh, that's not showing here. Sorry about that. Number of leads. Number of leads. Next one you're going to be showing on here is dollars sold. And I'll come back through and, and we'll do this in more detail in a moment with a couple examples. Next one on here is going to be the number of sales. So this column here has the revenue sold. This has the number of sales by that source. Next on here is going to be the gross profit or ideally gross profit margin of the sales made to that source or tactic. Again, we'll come back to this in detail in a moment. Number six is going to be on average, what's the average dollar sold per lead by this type of lead source? Okay. Next one over here is going to be number seven on the column here is going to be what's the average unit of sale? We call that the average dollars per sale. So if you had 10, 10 sales of, uh, and, and, and of 100,000 of revenue, it's 10,000 per sale. It's their average unit of sale by lead source. And then number eight, I'm going to actually do this one in a different color. This one is one that very few businesses think about, but it's my favorite one to get to because it really gives you such powerful information. It's your ROI, your return on investment. Um, and the way you think about it is what's your dollar ROI per $1 spent on this lead source. Your dollar ROI per $1 spent on this lead source. I'm going to leave the two more columns here. I'm going to leave them blank for just a moment here. We're going to come back to this column and this column here in just a moment. So we'll leave those ones here for just a second. We'll come back to them. Okay. So I want you to think about what are some tactics that you can have that you have in your marketing? What are some of the lead sources you have? Like, for example, you might have um, Facebook and Instagram ads might be one of your lead sources that you have. You might have one of your lead sources might be um, um, SEO. One of your lead sources might be direct mail. One of your lead sources for your business might be referrals from clients. Right? And the list can go on and on. But you're thinking, what are your main lead sources? And what we're going to do is we're going to be able to track back to what are the number of leads per lead source. So for example, let's say you had, and you can pick whatever period of time. Generally, if you set this up right in the right spreadsheet or um, you use one of the online tools like Google Data Studio, which by the way, uh, is a, essentially a free product to pull in information from different databases. Yes, you're going to require some programmer time or somebody knows how to set it up. But Google Data Studio, we use it. Um, and it's fantastic. It, it makes this reporting essentially automated. It pulls from our CRM, it pulls from other sources, and it's fantastic. But you might use a different one, that's fine. But you can do the same thing in a spreadsheet. I like being able to start with a spreadsheet to nail my tracking and how it should work, and then and only then put it into software. Um, that is, is kind of more of an automated software. Why? Because if you can nail the spreadsheet, then tracking it in the software becomes easy. You, you know exactly what you're trying to do and how to set up the rules and the, and the logic. If you keep changing it in software, like the, the automated data, it's very expensive. But if you change it in a spreadsheet, it's easy. It's inexpensive. So nail it in your spreadsheet, then put it over into software later on. And if you wanted, you can even do it old school on a whiteboard. I don't think that's the best choice, but you could be looking at this, your number of leads per week, uh, month to date, quarter to date, year to date. You can do it for time periods. But uh, generally speaking, on the spreadsheet, you know, probably one, you know, doing this month, monthly um, would be the minimum. So you have you know, for the month of January, February, March, April. And then you're probably going to also look at it as what's the year-to-date look for that, what's the quarter-to-date view. And you can set that up in the spreadsheet. The cool part about using more software-based stuff, the, like for example, the Google Data Studio, you can actually customize the periods of time that it's pulling the data for and running the report to make it look for the last seven days, the last 26 days, and it's, it's, it's set up nicely. Okay, so let's say that you've got 
I'm going to make up in this month, you've got 100 leads that came in from Facebook and Instagram. You had um, 15 leads that came from SEO. You had 50 leads that came from direct mail and 35 leads that came from referrals for a total of 200 leads. That's our example here. So now we look at dollars sold, and I'm not going to do this for all of them, but I'll do this for a couple. Let's say for dollars sold, out of these 100 people, um, first of all, you, you, you had a total of, I'll make up a number here, let's say you had a total of 10 sales to Facebook, Instagram people. Let's say you had um, three sales to SEO folks. You had five sales to direct, mark, direct response marketing, your direct mail. And then you had, um, let's say it's seven sales to your referrals. And the average, we, we look at it here, you made a total of, I'm going to just make it up here, uh, $100,000 in sales to Facebook, Instagram, thirty grand to SEO, fifty grand to direct mail, and you might say that for referrals, you had, um, we'll make that here, let's make it a hundred grand too. Okay? So for total sales in this period, you had a hundred and two hundred, two hundred and eighty $280,000 sold. Okay? So this is our example here. We're just building up our part. And we had a total number of sales of 25 sales. And now the next part here, by the way, just from looking at that, you can now divide what your conversion rates are. If I had 10 sales to 100 leads, my conversion rate is 10%. If I had seven sales for 35 leads, my conversion rate is 20%. So I can, I can generate the conversions off this information to tell me what's my, my closing rate. And so seven divided by 35 is, is, is five. So Right, 7 divided by 35 is going to be 20% is the math going to be. 10 divided by 100 leads, it says you're going to have a 10% conversion on that. Now, gross profit, What's, you can use this either as percent or you can use this as a, a margin expressed. Um, this can be either as a percent or as a actual raw dollars. I'm going to use it as a percent. So let's say out of this $100,000 of business that we ended up with a We'll make it here a 60% gross profit margin, right? And then out of our, I'm just going to jump down here to our referrals, we might have a 70% gross profit margin just because they're easier to work with because they're referred. Again, I'm making that up. Now, these others might be anywhere in between or even one way or the other. What this tells you is that this client is less profitable than this client. You had better conversion. If I had to choose, now I'm not going to choose one or the other, but if I had to, I'm going to probably at this stage give more of a nod to referrals over the Facebook Instagram to some degree. Now, the problem with that, though, is that I have a lot more volume with Facebook Instagram than I do with my referrals. So I might discover that, that it's not as scalable, and we'll get to that in a moment. But again, this is me thinking about it. Now, the dollars per lead, if I have um, 100 leads and they've done $100,000 in sales, every lead I get is worth $1,000 from uh, Facebook Instagram. I had 35 leads producing 100,000 in sales. Oh boy, now I got to do a little bit more math. Um, I might even just, I probably should be able to do the math right here on the top of my head. But I've learned that when I'm doing something live, I, I just take a moment and, and, and use a calculator. Why? Because I've had too many experiences where I did the math all wrong. But let's do the math cl closely. I take my 35 leads and I divide that by 100,000 in sales. Pardon me, I did it the wrong way. 100,000 in sales. I take my, my total number of revenue and divide that with the 35 going into it. That gives me my average per sale. So that means for every lead that comes in for a referral lead, on average, it's worth $2,857. I am really glad I grabbed a calculator. So again, I take my total revenue, divide it by the total number of leads from that source, and that gives me my dollars per lead from that source. And so again, we're seeing that referral leads are more valuable in this fictitious business. All right, now let's keep building. The average dollar per sale. So if I had 10 sales generating $100,000 of revenue, on average, that's $10,000 per sale on average. Right? That's simple to do. I take my $100,000 of sales, divide that by 10 sales. That gives me $10,000 per sale on an average. You'll hear this in marketing terms. What's your average, quote, unit of sale, close quote? On our other example here, we had seven sales generating um, $100,000 of business, so I'm going to use my calculator again. 
$100,000. Divide that $100,000 by seven sales. And that means that each sale I did wasn't worth 10,000. It was an average of $14,285 per sale, right? That's good to know. Um, on the comparison, I can see, well, wow, this, this person's gonna be worth about almost 42% more per sale. And each of these leads is much, much more valuable because of the conversion rate differences. That's interesting. That's good to know. Let's go one more though. So if I had the, the, the dollar ROI per dollar spent, so here's what I'm gonna do. I know that for every one dollar, for every $100,000, or oh, actually, no, I need to put down the dollar revenue. I, I missed a column here, excuse me. I'm gonna add a column here right now, which is the total spend. How much total did I spend on the marketing tactic? Now you might have to get, oops, it went up too high. Yep, it did. All right, so the dollars spend per tactic to generate it. And it's still, I'm looking here, it's not giving you a very clear picture. Nope, okay. <laughs> it's giving you a little bit of a, of a glare. So let's put it down a little bit lower. The dollars spent on the tactic or the lead source. So for example, if I spent um, on my Facebook, Instagram, I'm gonna make up the number here. Let's say I spent $50,000 to generate that $100,000 of business. That's not gonna work. That's, 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 that would probably be a pretty poor choice. Let's make it a little bit more, a little bit more friendly for us. Let's say we spent $20,000 for Facebook and Instagram. And on the referral side, you know, we, we maybe give some rewards to clients that, that do a referral, and maybe we give a little bit of reward to the client that comes in from the referral. Maybe we spent for these seven sales, we spent a total of, I'll make it here, maybe, well, let's make it a, let's make it $12,000. Let's say we spent $12,000. Okay. So what I can do is I can try to figure out a way to compare for the money I spent here, what did I get for every dollar I spent, how much revenue did I get? What was my return, my, my revenue generated per dollar spent on that tactic? What was my revenue generated per dollar spent on this tactic? And, and if you think about it, it's probably not that hard to do math-wise. We know we, we generated $100,000 of sales from that a Facebook and Instagram, right? So we know that that's what we generated. Um, and then we also know that it cost us $20,000 to do that. So simple math tells us that for every $1 we spent on this marketing tactic, we generated $5 of revenue for every $1 spent. How do we do that? $100,000 divided by 20,000, that gives us five. So for every dollar we spent on Facebook, Instagram, we generated $5 of revenue. But for every dollar spent on referrals, we can take our same $100,000, divide that now by the 12,000, and that tells us we get $8 actually $8.33. So for every dollar we spent on our referrals, we got $8 back. On its surface, which is a better lead source for us, right? It gives us a simple way to compare apples to apples. Plus, if you remember in the last episode, I talked about that construction company, wherein they ended up doing about half a million a year on their Facebook and Instagram, only to discover for every dollar they spent, they generated less than a dollar of revenue, of revenue back. Clearly, they could not sustain that. Now they were profitable, but because of other parts of their business were profitable. But they were able to essentially, not fully eliminate, but to cut that radically back um, and become much, much more profitable as a company. Okay, I've got two more columns here that I wanna talk about. I think it's important to ask how scalable is that marketing tactic? On a scale of one to five, how scalable is it? And then let's ask one more, the next column over, I, I know you can't see it here on the board, but I'll, I'll do it differently here, which is how easy or hard it is. We'll call this how easy is it to implement, to do this, one to five. These are qualitative measures that we're trying to put some quantitative rigor back to that. So when I have this all laid out, what becomes clear is you can figure out that, that referrals might be based on your ROI and based on the unit of sale and based on the conversion rate you might find that they're the best, but you might discover that your referrals, really to scale that, you might say that for scalability, they're gonna be a two, right? You, you, you're already getting most of what you can get from that. Whereas Facebook, Instagram, 
you might put that down as a four or a five in terms of scalability. So we have to consider that, that when we make decisions about where to put more energy and attention. Now, if we discovered that our referrals, we had a four out of five in terms of scalability, well, then the place we should put our best energy would be on the referral side. And you might say, well, David, that's it for us, right? We, we do, we get referrals, but it's mostly from passive word of mouth. We don't do formalized referral systems. You know, for example, in a construction world, formalized referral systems would include having your salesperson who sold the job formally ask with a script for referrals. Hey, Mrs. Johnson, as you're starting here, I'm curious, are there other neighbors that you would ever want to come by and see the, the see this when we're done? We, we often will do a party and let you show off your, you know, your, your new kitchen to the community, right? And they'll have the salesperson bring in some food and they can invite their neighbors over and of course, that's a way of generating referrals. Another way to do referrals in a construction business is to go around to all the neighbors and do a little bit of canvassing, right? Oh yeah, we're just over there at Mrs. Jones' house. I thought since I was here, I would just walk around the neighbor and see if there are other people who might also need work like this done. At the end, when Mrs. Jones gives you a compliment, oh, David, this is the best kitchen remodel. I, 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 it's what I dreamed of. Oh, Mrs. Jones, that makes me feel wonderful. Tell me, um, when you think about this, who are two other people that you know that would, would love a kitchen like you have now? People that love to cook, um, but have been just living with their existing kitchen that's way, out, way, way so dated. Who are people that you know here locally? Two people that you know. I can ask for a referral. Hey, would you be willing to introduce me to, to Jody and, and, and to Pamela? Wonderful. I'll make it easy for you. Um, why don't I do this here? Uh, you know, you and I have done a lot of our communication by email. I'll email you an example of how to make a, a simple introduction. You can, you can edit if you want or just forward it on to them, CC me there, right? But if you would, it would mean the world to me. You know, a third of our business comes from referrals we believe strongly in, right? So when you do your marketing laid out where you can see it all this way, it makes easy decisions of where to put energy and attention on and where you can stop putting energy and attention on. And we talked about this before. We, we gave you the, the key language for the four. Remember this? We said, we need you to feed your winners and we need you to starve your losers. But to do that, you've got to know what your winners are and what your losers are. And so what will happen is you might have seven, ten different marketing tactics. One or two are going to clearly be strong ones and one or two are going to clearly be weak ones. And then the stuff in the middle, it's hard to know. Don't put your best energy on the middle and don't try to fix the losers. Cut the losers, spend down the losers, uh, um, deactivate the losers, or let them just run without any money into them. Reinvest in the one or two best. Keep mon monitoring over time because things will shift, things will change. And once per quarter is probably best practice, but at least once a year, make the decision where you're gonna go. If you were my client, I would coach you to do it quarterly, and you being the marketing lead for your company. Again, this is a fairly uh, sophisticated way of thinking about tracking that way, uh, of doing your reporting. Probably going to apply to you if you're a, an advanced stage level two business or a level three business. Probably not quite what you'll start with as a middle stage level two business unless you have some you know, precision and chops in the marketing side, in which case it could apply. But it will apply to you as you grow and scale. The big mistake, again, is why I see people where they'll spend money fixing losers or they'll put money across all of them to try to fix all of them. Don't do that. Put all your attention to fix your, not to fix, but to improve and to feed your very best one or two. Get the attention by stopping investing time, attention, or money in the lower loser and leave the middle ground alone. That's not where you're going to get the best effect with that part. Um, I'll give a quick example for it. So this is one of our clients. Actually, both of these are clients. That's Bob on the left who owns a, a wholesale business in industrial parts. And that's Rob on the right hand side. I want to talk about Rob here for a moment. So now Rob owned a, a, a grouping of five, started with just three, but by the time he sold them um, and, and, and after, I want to say six years of coaching, he built that up to, to five different um, uh, car um, uh, maintenance stores and, and, and facilities for him. He did in Southern California. And when he first started doing, he would do things like direct mail to local uh, communities on what's called a carrier route, where it's the cheapest way to do direct mail, which is you give them the mailings, they put them out as they hit every box. It's, it's the least expensive way to do that. You don't get to choose which homes. It goes to every home in that carrier route. And he would do other marketing that he would have, signage, et cetera. But when he was looking at his, his results, one of his very best ways of getting new customers coming in 
um, by far was off of reviews online, Google and Yelp reviews. That was really important. And 10, 20 years prior, what, what would he have done? He probably would have looked at doing lots of different marketing stuff. Like most business owners, Rob was wired for action, for activity. And it made him really good at getting things started and generated, but it, he got bored with things pretty quickly. But by this point, we had met him. He was much more refined with what he did. He was much more able to, to make good choices about where to keep and maintain consistent energy. So he started doing campaigns around Yelp and around uh, Google reviews. And campaigns would include saying to his staff, hey, if somebody puts a five-star review and your name is in there, you get a $25 bonus, right? Things like that. And he would go and he would have his score, which was still a fairly good score, um, a low fours. He would get it up to the mid fours and the upper ends of fours. And it made a big difference on the business, on the volume. That's an example. Um, and this can work in any type of business, quite frankly. One of the medical groups we coach, um, they were doing this. They had uh, Their scores were so-so. Um, because the people who were really happy just didn't review it. The people who weren't happy were very quick to get on there. They did the same campaign. They picked up over 150 five-star reviews for their clinics in the city that they're in in one month. <laughs> it's fantastic for them. Made a big difference. But for Rob, it made the difference for him by putting his best energy on the one tactic that would make the biggest difference. And how do you know? You look at things like how scalable it is, but you look at what's my ROI per dollar spent. I look at things like what's my gross profit margin for that type of client. And I look at things like what's my conversion rates and it makes things easier for me to see. All right. So going back to it, this would be a point or a place where a marketing help would be really important for you. It's a fairly sophisticated way of doing the tracking. Again, you're going to put it first spreadsheet later on into software that gets automatically pulled from various aspects of your database and CRM. That's going to require some outside help, right? Or some internal people that have some real knowledge, whether that's a doer or the marketing strategist who can then hire out the technical programmers to get that work done. Both could have a good source of success. Start with the spreadsheet first if you don't have that already before you try to put it into the software. Why? If you can't nail it in the, in, in the spreadsheet, you're only going to waste money trying to nail it and figure it out while you do it in the software. All right. So what's my best coaching for you going forward? If you're a middle stage level two, go back to the last episode and I want you to think about how can you do some historic analysis about where your best customers come from, where your worst customers come from, so that you can make some decisions on where should you stop putting attention, where should you put attention in that much more rudimentary way. For those of you that are more of my advanced business owners, in this um, episode I was talking about how can you start putting together your tracking better. But I think what probably is the most important place for you to start is by taking a look at who do you have on your marketing team right now. If you say, David, we've got two people internally, we've got a marketing lead and an assistant marketing lead, and that would probably mean they're two doers. Let's take a look at what they're doing. Do they have tracking set up? If not, that's probably the first place that you're going to go. Let's say that, David, you say, we don't have any internal people, we just have external people, and right now our operations person manages them, and he's not really expert in marketing. Okay. Well, for you, it might make sense to either bring one of those people internal to be your marketing manager or to hire a fractional marketing manager. Now, notice I called it a marketing manager because in the case if you don't have internal people and you're just using outside people, you probably don't need a fractional chief marketing officer. Why? A, they're three, four times more expensive than a marketing manager or a director of marketing. And B, they're used to doing it for very large companies that have large budgets and, and, it, and they're not who you need right now. Now, when you grow to 50 million uh, or more, you probably do want that chief marketing officer, but at a $2 million business, a $10 million business, you probably don't need them. Somewhere between 10 and 50 million, you will, will need that head of marketing who really is more sophisticated, but you don't need it on the lower stages. So just consider that as you do it. So who do you have and who do you need? If you are going to need outside resources, go back to what I had shared with you about how to get the best from them based on the sales stage when you get their promises and document that, how you manage that relationship weekly, bi-weekly, monthly with the meetings, and how you hold them to account. Paying in arrears is, uh, is the best practice with that part. I hope you got a lot out of today's sessions. I know I was rattling off a whole bunch of stuff quickly, but my goal here is just to give you a lot of really good insight that's taking me thousands of clients and, what, two, three decades to figure out to, to give you the jump start 
Remember, as an owner of a business, you do not need to be the expert in marketing, but you've got to know enough to intelligently get the best from those people on your team and externally on your team who are doing the marketing for you. Good luck to you.